Entrepreneur on Fire, episode 119. Welcome to EntrepreneurOnFire.com, where remarkable entrepreneurs share their inspiring story. Let their journey illuminate your path to success. And now, your host, John Dumas. Fire Nation. Do you have a product or service that you would like to share with the 100,000 plus unique downloads Entrepreneur on Fire generates every month consisting of passionate entrepreneurs? Chris Brogan sponsored an episode for his book, The Impact Equation, with great results. If you would like to have 15 seconds at the top of Entrepreneur on Fire to share your product or message, go to SponsorEOFire.com to find out more. Okay, let's get started. I am simply thrilled to introduce my guest today, Aaron Schwartz. Aaron, are you prepared to ignite? Absolutely. All right, man. Aaron is the founder of Modify Watches. Have you not heard of this incredible timepiece? Modify Watches are super dope, interchangeable watches. Mix and match faces and straps to create the mod that allows you to make your statement, whether quiet or loud. I've given Fire Nation a little overview, Aaron, of Modify Watches, but why don't you take from here and tell us who you are and what you do? Uh, Sure. So my name is Aaron Schwartz, and I'm proud to say I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Modify is my second startup, um, and I started a few years ago with my friend Gary and another buddy, Ashil. And the idea of the company is letting fans, customers show their colors. So I'm a history major and a consultant at MBA, um, definitely not a designer, definitely not the the most fashionable person in the world. And so we're just trying to create products um, that let you kind of tell your own story. So love Threadless, so we try and do a little bit of a crowdsourcing model. We like Zazzle, so we try and do a limited edition kind of custom runs model. And we love Zappos, so a lot of customer service. And you take all those and you've got our first product, which is this interchangeable watch. Um, And yeah, we're moving on to some other interchangeable products too. Outside of that, for me, I coach basketball and I work a lot. So I'm not as exciting, I think, as I once was as a person, but, uh, but I'm a happy guy. <laughs> That's all that matters. And Aaron, I was an American histories major. I had nothing to do with communications in college. So believe me, we're in the same boat here. We uh, just are following our passions here, which is creating something awesome. So thank you for being that entrepreneurial spirit. And thank you for having that just passion and going forward with that. I like it. Thanks. So Aaron, we're going to transition now into our first topic, and that's the success quote, because Entrepreneur on Fire, it's about passion, it's about excitement, and we want to get the motivational ball rolling with your favorite success quote. What do you have for us today? Sure. So so mine's a bit tame, but I actually think it's pretty critical if you're going to be a a good entrepreneur. So it's, uh, it's Socrates, and it's the only true wisdom is knowing that you know nothing. I like that. It is tame in some sense, but it has a lot of meaning behind it. Why don't you take it down to the ground level and how have you applied it to either this current startup or your past current startup? Sure, sure. So uh, I'm 30. My brother's a couple years older than me. And I, I remember being in high school, you know, he, he's just starting college. And he gave me the best advice I'd heard, which is kind of equivalent to this, which is you don't know what you don't know. Right. And I really thought, long and hard about that. And I've kind of applied it to everything. Um, it's made me ask folks a lot of questions. It's made me assume that, you know, like any obstacle I come across, it's not that it's impossible to get by, but it kind of gives me the encouragement to say that, you know, I, I don't know it. I don't know all the possible solutions, um, but I know somebody who does. Um, so as I'm, you know, my first business, now the second one, <laughs> Yeah, like I said, my background is, is is as generic as they come, right? Or I guess as generalist as they come. Uh, being a management consultant was great. And I learned a ton. Being an MBA is great. And I learned a ton. Um, but every day we come across new things. And um, kind of taking that in stride, it's it's really helped me. I think it's helped humble me a lot. Um, and it also just it forces me to ask a ton of questions, which, which enables me to meet new people and come up with more innovative solutions, I think, to the roadblocks bo- that we run into. Absolutely. And at Entrepreneur on Fire, it is all about the journey. So your journey as a history major, getting your MBA, it's all kind of transpired into what you are now, which is the entrepreneur. So it's all very important. And we'll use that to transition now into our next topic. 
which is failure. As an entrepreneur, we always have trials and tribulations that we are facing every day, day in and day out. Throughout our journey, it is just fraught with challenges and obstacles. And this is about your journey, Aaron. Can you take us back to a failure or a challenge that you've had that you really had to overcome and that you learned a lot from? Sure. Um, so I think the first, <laughs> our first business, I wouldn't call it failure, but I call it a, a, an you know, incredibly difficult challenge. Um, I started it with three friends and I remain good, close friends with all of them today. Uh, the issue was it was it, we had a lot of big ideas. It was a sustainability business, and we were trying to make it fun to be sustainable. Um, kind of, there was a points aspect. There was some infrastructure aspect about we we're trying to encourage folks to refill a water bottle, right? Because that small action, you you save a plastic bottle from a landfill. The idea being is you kind of train people, and you start with high school and college kids. Um, the more they take many sustainable actions and the more they're thoughtful in their decisions, the more impactful it'll be as they consider what car to buy, if they're even going to buy a car, as they consider what house to buy eventually. Um, so it was this very big idea. And a lot of those aspects of that business have come out in a lot of other cool startups. Um, but the challenge was we had this huge idea and we had a terrible team. Um, and not terrible people, not need people, but we were four MBAs. Um, one had come from uh, biotech and you know, had a patent, it was brilliant. Um, the other had come from finance and was great operationally, and the other one was also kind of finance, real estate, and great. And you know, like I said, I was a management consultant. But we didn't have any design minds on the team, and we didn't have any tech talent. Um, and so it was like this big idea that we loved, um, but just absolutely the wrong team. Um, and we struggled through for you know, a year and a half. I don't know, it was a, it was a lot of work for um, for an incredible amount of learning, maybe not much uh, financial outcome. So let's take it down to the ground level. What was a lesson that you can truly look back at and you can say that you pulled out of that experience? Yeah, um, so uh, we, we started this during business school and second semester of my first year, the entire summer in between first and second year, and then almost all of second year I worked on this. Um, during my second semester of my second year, I took a class from Steve Blank and Eric Rees, right? So um, customer development, lean startup methodology. If you're, if you're an entrepreneur, I, I don't think it matters if you're an entrepreneur. If you're anybody doing any work anywhere, um, I think you need to read the work that these guys have been putting out. Um, lean startup and um, uh, I think Steve Blank's new book is a startup owner's manual. Anyway, so I, t I took this class and the big ideas from the class were one, you don't know anything. <clears throat> don't build a product for yourself. Build it for your customers. So lesson one is get outside your four walls, your office, and go talk to as many customers as you can and figure out what they truly want. Um, that's more of a Steve Blank lesson. And the Eric Ries lesson, which is equally if not more impactful, is the idea of a minimum viable product. So we were trying to build this exceptional product, um, again, without having yet really talked to customers. Um, but the idea is take a step back make a viable product so you can't, you can't produce junk, but it doesn't have to be pretty, right? You just need to really kind of sell the story and get feedback from folks. Uh, and so that's completely changed how we approach uh, Modify and, you know, that could not have been a, a better lesson. I love that lesson. And Eric Reese with The Lean Startup has so many great lessons with just that book in general. And it does just speak exactly what you're talking about is to you want to create a minimally viable product because they were talking so much about creating this perfect product and they were trying to spend so much time before launch. And then as soon as they launched, they realized they spent all this time doing all these features that the customers didn't even necessarily want or need. So you never know what your customer is going to want until you launch. So launch as quick as you can with a minimally viable product and then adjust from there with the feedback. How did you do that with Modify Watches? Yeah, sure. So um, the idea for Modify came from my partner, Gary. Uh, he'd been traveling in Asia and he saw some interchangeable products. And the value proposition is pretty clear if you can actually interchange something. So you buy one watch, you've got a watch. If you buy a second watch, you've now got four, right? Because each face can interact with each strap. And so we thought that was very cool, um, both from a, like a cash value to a customer, right? Like you can get a lot of looks for a lot less money than buying individual pieces but also from um, forget the savings just it's more fun right like you can always mix and match and you can match your outfit um, and so we knew we wanted to do this business um, but we didn't exactly know what, what that business would be would we just be a watch company would we do a lot of other products 
And so I was very insistent from day one where I said, listen, we're, we're not going to spend any money. We're going to put up a very cheap website, which ended up being a, a Weebly website. So it's kind of a drag and drop you know, website tool where you say, I want an image here and to check out here and whatever. Um, and then what we did is we actually ordered product online um, and then we rebranded it. So, you know, we were taking somebody else's product and saying this is now ours. And we were really conscious of what that would entail, right? The quality would be okay, right? The watch would tick, but maybe there would be a scratch on it, right? So it was truly a minimum viable product. It was viable, it let customers know, hey, we're a watch that's interchangeable, but it was minimum, right? It wasn't beautiful and it was fine. And so what we did is we immediately sent out um, an email to friends and family, like as quickly as we could, once, once we got product in hand. And when people bought, we'd send them a second watch for free. Right? And if somebody came back and said, hey, it's defective, we'd send them a third one. If they came back again, we'd say, listen, we're going to refund you, but we'll send you a fourth one. The idea at the beginning was we do not care about money. We don't care about profit. We'll take a loss on every sale. Right? We would refund anybody who asked for it. And in fact, you know, even if they didn't ask, if we knew that we'd quote unquote screwed up, we'd immediately refund them and say, hey, I refunded you, but there's another one. Because what we were interested in was, one, did people buy a single watch or did they like the idea of the interchangeability? Right? Was there some value there and we wanted we, we thought there was but we wanted to test it and then two we wanted to see if there is this value how do they interchange do they buy um, very colorful wrist straps right and so the difference between maybe the face and the strap is the strap you can see across a room and you really make a statement right if you're wearing a pink wristwatch which I'm wearing today um, for our breast cancer awareness partner um, uh, anybody across the room can see it but if you're wearing a pink face uh, it's more of a, um, it's a muted statement, let's say, um, with a black strap. And so we were just trying to understand the customer psychology, how people, what, what they liked about it. Um, and then once we thought we'd learned enough, we, we called as many customers as we could and we just got a ton of feedback. And so some people said we want a backlight and some people said we want a calendar, but almost everybody said we want water resistance and everybody said we want a smaller size and everybody said we want it to be more durable. And so we took those learnings, which were a couple months, right? Uh, again, we quote unquote lost some money on that, but that was fine because it was an investment in getting as much information as we could. And then we invested, uh, you know, I think a round numbers like sixty or seventy thousand dollars in reinventing the product with all of the customer feedback we got. So we didn't add the special features of a calendar because five percent of people wanted it, but we did add water resistance, right? And so if I was building a watch from scratch, my ideal watch has a, a stopwatch and a calendar and whatever it does. But we learned enough from starting with MVP that we only did the product. I love that. And now my next question is, one, did you have investors? And two, if so, how did you convince your investors to allow you to take a loss on every product? Yeah, so, so we did not have investors. And that was the second piece of it, right? We wanted to save time and we wanted to save money. So I think we each put in maybe five hundred or thousand dollars up front, and we did this with a backstop of we both had full time job offers. Um, and so after a couple of months, Gary actually ended up taking his his job, and he's uh, been at Samsung in Korea for a couple of years, and he loves it. I'm still an advisor, still involved in the business, um, but I kept deferring my full time job, and then eventually they were like, "Why don't you stick with what you're doing, and you'll come back if you ever need to?" So so it was great, right? And I, I guess I get to give a little plug for Deloitte Consulting because. Um, They've been as supportive as anybody in, in this journey. Um, and so from the beginning, it was our own money, but it was, you know, we would make an oath to then invest in the next product. Just, um, at some point, we had a couple of us who were pretty excited about investing, and we finally took a very small amount of money in March of this year. Um, but we've, we've kind of, we, we're, we're considering starting a fundraising round right now. I'm actually flying to New York in a couple of days for a few meetings with investors. Um, but uh, it's one of those things where I don't want to play with somebody else's money until I'm 100% confident in what we're doing. Um, so any investor who would be concerned about me testing isn't an investor I want, right? Like I don't have the answers and you need to know I don't have the answers and we're going to, even when we get great, we could still do better. Um, and so that, that's kind of our approach. I love that. Thank you for sharing that insight with us. It's just very, sure. very interesting. So we're going to move now to our next topic, which is the other end of the spectrum. As an entrepreneur, you have your trials and tribulations, but you also have those beautiful moments where you have those aha moments. Now, obviously, Aaron, you have inspirational moments probably every day, these little aha moments that just 
keep you going and inspire you and just propel you to that next level. Can you take us back at some point in your journey when you actually had this great light bulb come on, this aha moment that just burst through the clouds? Can you take us through that time? Yeah, sure. So, so I'm, I'm the kid who, when I was like 10, started a bank account with my buddy and we put in half of our allowance and we wanted to start a baseball card store. I, I'm Aaron with two A's and he's Andrew with one A and so we we're going to call triple A baseball cards, right? And then when I was in college, I um, at Columbia, we were a couple blocks away from Barnard College and there, there were a ton of students and there was no fast food near campus so I tried to get a Subway franchise, right? And then after the New York Marathon, I would buy shoes and then resell them on eBay. So I always had these ideas, some really silly, and then you know, some when I was living in London, I, I, I tried to become the distributor for vitamin water before it was bought by Coke, right? So some really big ideas that I was super passionate about. Um, what my aha moment was with Modify, right? So we do this minimum viable product and it's fun and you know our friends love it and everybody likes the colorfulness and it's cool that we're doing this business. Um, but for me, the aha moment was that I didn't need to think about this as a watch. Um, I, I don't look at, um, I mean, obviously it is a watch, it's a timepiece and it's, it's fashionable. Um, but I look at the, the product that we're selling as a vehicle for me to build the business I wanna build. Um, and now that might, might sound a little convoluted, right? But some of my favorite books are, um, are like Peak by Chip Conley, um, Danny Meyer's book. Danny Meyer is, um, I'm going to screw it up, right? But it's Union Square, um, all, all, all the great restaurants in New York, um, Gramercy Tavern, et cetera. Um, I love Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea, right? So a big thing for me is, is customer service, um, but not just like, you know, smiling and saying thank you, but like really going over the top, not with the goal of like, becoming best friends with folks, but letting them know that, hey, if you're going to give me even 25 cents, like I'm going to be incredibly grateful because you're letting me live my life, right? Um, and so that was one piece. Uh, the second was, uh, like I said earlier, I've always really admired Threadless, which is this idea of like, we, the company, don't know what you want. You just tell us what you want and we'll make it, right? And, and, and Zazzle or Cafe Press are kind of equivalent companies in that, a, a, a different angle on it. Um, and so I started to look at Modify, not as like, ah, I'm a watch company and I'm competing with Swatch and with Nixon, but more as like, we don't have to compete with anybody. We just have to do what we want to do and do it well, right? So for Modify, that means we would a, a handwritten note with every customer order. When somebody comes back a second time, it's not the exact same thing. We say, listen, thank you so much for coming back, right? Um, and that happens very frequently. We've got a really high repurchase rate. When somebody orders a watch as a gift, we throw in an extra strap as a thank you. Um, we don't tell the, the recipient that that strap is from us. We make it seem like it's from the person who purchased because it's a better gift that way, right? And so um, I think what led to that moment is I've spent my whole life admiring different businesses, right? And trying to figure out what works and what doesn't and what eyes a consumer like. Um, and like I literally just think it modifies a platform for you know, it's not just a watch company. I don't, I don't think of us as a watch company. I think of us as, you know, I mean, so as it may sound like a personalized service, um, get you what you want company. And so that, um, you know, that, that keeps me happy every day because I, I do not read watch um, industry reviews. I, I literally don't care when somebody sends me something about a competitor. Like I care as much as I can learn from what they're doing and say those guys are doing a great job and I can get better. Um, but I don't care about are we losing market share or anything like that because – we're, we're just building the business we want and that's um it's pretty liberating and i think it's more exciting too um, that opens you up to kind of build as you wish that's great focus aaron and that really does allow you to be the leader in the industry instead of just chasing others in your own industry so i definitely commend that and i love the specificness that you got down to with you would send an extra band you know, with an order to really improve that order and that gift in general. That was an action you took because of your aha moment. Can you give us one other really cool action like that that you do because of that aha moment that you had? This this may not be as exciting on a day-to-day basis. We do, we do a lot of custom orders. So we've customized, I think, 13 different designs for Google, right? So those are either as employee gifts, year-end gifts, um, or recruiting tools or products that are sold in their store, right? And we've worked with Deloitte and HP. Um, we've got some licensed partners. Anyway, we, we've got all these big brands that we work with, right? It's kind of like the secret side of our business. Um, I, not really a secret. I let you guys in, but you know, we don't we don't talk about that through Facebook or or when we're talking to our kind of um, individual consumers. Um, pretty much every time we do one of those orders, we've got kind of a menu of options, right? So you can customize packaging and you can custom, you can engrave the back of the watch, right? So we'll we'll do a fully custom watch and <clears throat> it'll be only for your group. Um, we we treat those partners exactly the same way. 
where if they, you know, were doing a design and then like they're close, but they can't afford the extra, let's say it's $2 for some feature, right? For engraving or whatever it is. But we know that it makes the watch better. Like we're talking companies that have, you know, tens of thousands of times more revenue than we have. And we're still saying, listen, like we'll take the loss on this because your fan, your, your recipients will like it better. Um, and I think that's just, you know, it's not, um, it's not a long-term play of like, oh, they'll come back because they're grateful. It's we're making people happy and that should make it better. Like the entire experience with the product will be better in the long run. It should benefit everybody. And if it doesn't, that's fine. Um, we're okay taking a little bit of a quote unquote loss in exchange for making a, a better product. I love that. We're going to use that to move into our next topic, which is your current business. You have shared a lot with us about your current business, what you do, what your philosophies are. And I really love everything that encompasses modify watches. Can you tell us one thing that's really exciting you about your business today? Um, yeah, there, there, there's a lot that excites me and a lot that stresses me out. Um, so it's fourth quarter. So, so a couple things that are on my mind right now. Uh, this week we've got, we're, we're, we were just featured on spin.com with an exclusive. We've got a license with Live Nation for Dead Mouse, um, who's electronic dance music, this amazing, um, this amazing artist. And we customize a watch for them. And we, we launched it today. Um, tomorrow we're going to be on Rachel Ray show. Uh, Wednesday we're going to be on the Today Show and Thursday we're going to be on MSNBC. So like, you know, we've been building for two years and building this good foundation and now we're just starting to see um, a lot of really nice press hits, right? No, no one thing is going to carry the day or anything, but it's nice to see it come together well. Um, it's exciting for our whole team. It's exciting for our designer who's this incredible graphic designer who's run a studio for a decade. Um, his name's Ashiel. And now he's seeing his stuff literally everywhere. So, so that's very cool. Um, the second thing that's exciting for us is, is retail. Uh, in the same way we are kind of a little too ambitious about our customer service approach and we grow slower than we maybe need to because we don't want to grow faster than we can service every customer as if they're kind of our best friend. Um, we, for two years, refused to go into retail because we don't want to take on a retail account where you know, let's say that there's an issue, I, I, you can make up any issue that we don't have the capacity to handle it. Um, so two months ago, we were finally like, okay, we're ready and we think we can do this. And we picked up maybe 20 boutiques and across the US and that's pretty exciting. Um, but we just had our first major retail account, I call it, which would be Best Buy. Uh, so we're, we're doing a custom watch for them, but not as a gift to employees. Um, we're doing the custom watches, a unique um, product for, for all their stores across the US. So that's uh, that, that's pretty exciting for us right now. A little a little scary, uh, but I think we'll be okay. Man, Rachel Ray, the Today Show, MSNBC, Entrepreneur on Fire, all in the same week, all in the same <laughs> breath. <laughs> <laughs> so, Aaron. We all here at Fire Nation love Shark Tank, and I think I know the answer to this question. But would you? ever accept an invitation to go on Shark Tank to potentially get in front of Damien John? So this is really interesting. I'll, I'll be very blunt about this. Um, so I used to live in London and before Shark Tank there was Dragon's Den and I watched that show all the time because I thought it was awesome. Um, I think in Canada they call it Dragon's Den too. And I really like Shark Tank. Um, forget the theatrical nature of it. I think it's, I think it's amazing. Um, when we first started, we were asked to go on um, and we went through the application process and everything. Um, and then I realized very quickly that even if we were on for 20 seconds and it was a complete fail, we couldn't handle the, the push of customers that would come to our site, right? We, we didn't have inventory, we didn't have a good enough product. Uh, so we decided not to do it then. At this point, I, I think it would be an incredible opportunity. Uh, there is a, a constraint with Shark Tank where when you go on the show, whether you get an invest not, they take a piece of your company. Um, they, I, I think it's a choice between a bit of equity um, and common shares or op, like a percentage of operating income indefinitely. And so at the time, it didn't make sense for, for us at all. Today, it's something where that's a huge, you know, that that's forever, right? It's not a little bit of value that somebody's taking. I'm not writing them a check today, but it's as we grow as a company, we now have a little less asset that we can, you know, use for hiring um, or use for bonuses or, or however you want to think about it. Um, and so the value of Shark Tank is 
you get the equivalent of a couple hundred thousand dollar ad spend, right, on live TV. Uh, the downside is there's a cost, is there's a cost with everything. And I, I think it's very reasonable, um, but it's just something that we need to consider as a company. Uh, but I do, I do like the show, um, and those are absolutely some investors I'd be very curious about. Um, and as much as, as much as I should look into John, I, I think Mark Cuban has got to be the one. I'm, uh, the only topic I'm comfortable arguing about anymore is the NBA. So I think it had to Mark Cuban. Awesome. Well, we're working with Barbara's people right now to get her on the show. So when we do, we'll give you guys a plug and we'll see if you can pull some strings for you. I, I like it, man. Good luck. She, she's pretty spectacular. Um, she's awesome. She yeah. really has it going on. So, Aaron, we have now reached my favorite part of the show. We're about to enter the lightning rounds. This okay. is where I provide you with a series of questions and you come back with amazing and mind-blowing answers. Does that sound like a plan? No, no pressure at all. Let's, <laughs> let's do this. What was the number one thing that was holding you back from becoming an entrepreneur? Uh, I, I think I was always waiting for permission. And I don't really know from whom and I don't know for what, but I was always waiting. Like I didn't think I was quote unquote ready. Um, and I, I kind of realized that just by having that first business, whether good or bad didn't matter because it made me a significantly better entrepreneur. Um, so you know, my advice is just start. You don't need permission. What is the best business advice that you ever received? Uh, it's still minimum viable product, uh, whether it's for modify or <laughs> for, for personal things or, or any business I would ever do in the future. Um, thinking about everything as an MVP is very, very impactful. And the name modify even speaks to the MVP because you're willing to modify your product, your watch, what have you. Absolutely. That, that's all we do. We assume we don't know anything and we just let our customers tell us what to produce. I mean, that, that is literally written on our packaging. I love it. What's something besides that, which is obviously working for you, but what's something else that's working for you or your business right now? Um, I finally started to work out again. So I guess for me, that, that's a plus. Um, for, for the business, honestly, it's, it's maybe going a bit slower than we maybe like to by focusing every day on that personalized customer experience. So never sacrificing that um, in exchange for a little bit of growth. So Aaron, you're a young guy. You're 30 years old. I'm 32. So I'm pretty curious to see what your answers are going to be to this next question. Do you have an internet resource that you're in love with, like an Evernote that you would recommend to Fire Nation? So there are two things I do on the internet every day. <laughs> Number one is I use Asana, and I literally just started it. I tried a couple months ago. I didn't get into it. But um, as we've gotten busier, Asana is A-S-A-N-A -A, is amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, and the second thing I do on the internet is I read avc.com, um, as an a venture capitalist, avc.com. Uh, it's awesome, absolutely awesome. Go through the archives. Wonderful. And just give us a real quick 10 second sum up of what Asana is. Uh, Asana is basically task management, project management. Um, I'm trying to get my whole team on there. Basically, we're an email based company and it's getting super painful um, because we email each other. Plus, obviously, customers email us, which that part's great. But we we share we're small and we're lean. Um, and so we just need much better task management. And Asana really helps. Awesome. Exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. So what's the best business book that you've read in the last six months? Peak uh, by Chip Conley. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher the name, but he's uh, the founder of Joie de Vivre Hotels. So awesome boutique hotel chain. May, I think mainly on the West Coast. They may have got a, a couple elsewhere. Um, but it's basically taking Maslow's hierarchy and putting it into business. Um, it, it, it's all about... Uh, your investors, your employees, and your customers, and making sure that everybody really gets fulfillment from, from their job. Uh, Peak is P-E-A-K. It's an awesome book. Wonderful. We always link all books and links to you all in our show notes, so it will all be there. Cool. This last question is my favorite, Aaron. It's kind of a tricky one, so take your time and digest it before you answer. If you woke up tomorrow morning and you still had all of the experience, knowledge, and money that you currently have today, but your business had completely disappeared, forcing you to start with a clean slate, which many of our listeners find themselves with right now, what would you do? That's interesting. I, there, there are a couple things that 
make me happy on a pretty daily basis um, when, when I get to spend the time doing them. And so I don't think my first would be starting a new business and trying to kill it. I, I think I'd first play a lot of basketball, um, as silly as that may sound. Like it's being an entrepreneur is, is all encompassing. And I just, you know, I want to find some friends and just, just play some hoops. Um, I, the second thing is uh, I've got a bunch of friends with different startups. Um, and I just want to go help them with their businesses. I do it now, um, not for equity, not for salary, just for the learning. And I find that I learn more uh, more from that than anything else that I do on a daily basis. Um, and then, of course, I'd, I'd want to call my parents and say, hey, I, li- I like talking to my folks. And so instead of running meeting to meeting, I'd maybe spend a little bit longer on the phone with them. So it would be Aaron Schwartz, consultant slash hoopster. Yeah, absolutely. I <laughs> call it hoopster slash consultant, but, but that's your call. Slash good, good child. <laughs> I love it, Aaron. You have given us some great advice throughout this entire interview, and we are all better for it. Give Fire Nation one parting piece of guidance, then give yourself a plug, and then we'll say goodbye. Okay. It's a little daunting of a question. I, I, I think the, the guidance that I give to anybody who's interested in being an entrepreneur is just start. Um, it's easy. Make it easy on yourself. Just start something. It doesn't matter what the idea is. It doesn't matter if it's a good idea. You'll learn so much from the process and it'll make you kind of re-envision how you do whatever's next. Um, and a final plug for myself, it's like I'm trying to get a date or something. Uh, check out modifywatches.com or our Facebook page, facebook.com slash modifywatches. Uh, we've got a really active community. We're launching uh, all of our fall collection, including a Tetris watch and a Dead Mouse watch and some Major League Baseball watches and a bunch of all our designs soon. And uh, we all have designed kind of competitions where y'all tell us what to produce and we'll try and make it for you. So uh, thank you very much for, for your time today. This is awesome. Very fun. Thanks a lot, Aaron. I really had a lot of fun myself. I love talking to bootstrapping entrepreneurs like yourself. Fire Nation, we salute you. And we'll catch you on the flip side. Thanks so much. Fire Nation, you asked for it and I created it. My first free ebook, 10 Incredible Insights from 10 Incredible Entrepreneurs, is published. All four pages of it. Simply go to eofire.com and subscribe to my newsletter. You will get immediate access to the top business insights from the likes of Barbara Corcoran, Tim Ferriss, Gary Vaynerchuk, and seven other incredible guests. Prepare to ignite. Thank you for joining us at entrepreneuronfire.com, your daily dose of inspiration. Prepare to ignite.